talk about components and not layers today, how we build a component-based architecture. Um, and I learned that when you start a talk, you start with a big statement so that you get everyone's attention. So my big statement is um, software is under-engineered and software is over-engineered. Um, I'm pretty sure that most of you have worked in each of those projects once during your career. So you've probably worked in a project that is um, under-engineered, like a big ball of mud. You don't know how, where, where things are. And um, also in projects that are over-engineered, like uh, they're so complex, so many rules that you don't know um, how to do, how to change things. Um, but what I mean is that um, software is under-engineered and over-engineered at the same time. So the same software can be under-engineered and over-engineered, both at the same time. So how is that possible? Um, that's possible if we look at different aspects of the software. So what I mean with that is software is often under-engineered at the code level. So not enough structure in the code, not enough um, uh, organizing in the code. Um, and software is often over-engineered at the system level, microservices, distributed architecture. And how does that happen? Well, we start building software. We start building a monolith. Um, it grows and grows over time um, until we think it's too big and we don't understand it anymore. And what do we do? And then we're on the left side. We have a, an under-engineered big ball of mud, basically. Um, and what happens then is we cut it into multiple smaller code bases, which we think are more maintainable. Um, and then we build microservices. And we put each of these services, like deploy them separately, uh, in introduce a service mesh and um, everything, Kubernetes cluster, everything around that. And we feel that it's over-engineered. Um, so what I want to talk about today is um, like a middle ground. There must be something in between. And that in between, um, um, uh, yeah, what I forgot to mention is uh, when we think about under-engineered software, we often think about monoliths. That's the um, thing that comes into our mind. And if we think about over-engineered, we often think about microservices. Um, but there must be something in between, and that in between is um, a modular monolith. Um, you've probably, uh, for those who have been in, um, in the talk by Oli and Michael this morning, they've pretty much... Um, they did the work for me. I probably don't have to convince you anymore that um, modular monoliths are a good thing. So uh, the lead question for this talk today is um, how can we organize our code base to prepare it for a modular monolith? So it doesn't become this under-engineered big ball of mud monolith, um, but also we have enough structure that we don't need to split it up into microservices. Um, my definition of a monolith here is um, a deployment unit that, that contains more than one bounded context, whatever that is. Um, yeah, and so what I would like to talk about in this talk is how we get from here. This is how it often feels like working in, uh, in, in, in a code base. Uh, you see some layers in there. Um, but you don't really want to touch them because you might get hurt. And when you want to change something, you need a wrecking ball to actually change things. Um, what I want to show is a way of building an architecture more like this, um, where you have small, distinct components. Um, and you compose the architecture of those components. Uh, you can exchange components. Um, and it's altogether more flexible. Now, there, there's not going to be a big revelation in this talk. Like, I'm not going to introduce any mind-blowing new stuff. Um, it's all pretty, um, pretty old-school stuff like interfaces and abstractions and stuff like that. But I'm hoping that some of you might get inspiration from that. All right. So uh, you might think, what qualifies me to talk about that? Um, well, I'm a software engineer. Um, so I feel the pain of um, messy code bases every day, probably like all of you. Uh, unlike you, however, I have a very, very 
slow brain. So that means I need a lot, lot of time to understand things, and um, I'm really keen on making things as simple as possible so I can actually understand them. Um, and that means that I spend a lot of time trying to make things simple, and then I write about them so I don't forget it again. Um, this, I'll write about it on my blog, um, and I wrote a book about um, architecture code organization um, on, on clean and hexagonal architecture, uh, which we're also going to have a look at in this talk. All right. Let's get started. So, first of all, um, why organize code? Uh, like I said, Michael this morning already um, did the job for me, basically. Um, so, we want to, why do we want to organize code? We want to have modules in the code. I call them components in this, in this talk. Um, but why do we need to organize code? And um, the reason is that we have a lot of questions every day. Um, so every day we're working on code. Um, we're asking ourselves, where do I have to add this feature? Or what happens if I pull this feature out of here? What, what else is going to break? Um, and if the code is not organized properly, we don't have the answers to these questions, and we need to research them, and it's taking time and, um, and costs money. So the main goals of code organization, there are more than these, but these are the goals that I want to address in this talk are uh, maintainability, which is pretty obvious. Maintainability means, in general, keeping the code base in a state where it's, 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 it doesn't cost much to change things. So you could basically um, say that maintainability, mean, ma maintainability means um, small costs over time. Um, another goal of code organization is what, what I call evolvability. Um, if we're thinking about starting a new project and we're starting it as one code base, a mo which is a monolithic code base with multiple, um, which covers multiple bounded contexts, we might at one, uh, at one time come to a point where we want to split it up into microservices. But we don't want to do that now. We want to do that later at a point in time where it actually makes sense, where we have all the information um, to make that decision. Um, so if we have proper code organization, we have good evolvability because we have modules and we can pull out a module and put it somewhere else. For example, we can pull it out of a monolith, put it into a microservice, um, deploy it by itself. And then my favorite is understandability. Um, the better the code is organized, the easier it's to understand. Um, the quicker you are onboarded. Um, why is this my favorite? Because I have a very simple test for it. And the test is if I understand it, everybody else understands it too. Um, and that makes this my favorite goal because I, I can test it. All right, so two slides on why code organization is important. I'm hoping I don't need more to convince you. Um, now, code organization isn't anything new. We, we all do it, um, and the thing, uh, the pattern that many of us use and have, have seen everywhere is layers. Um, so let's start about talking about different types of code organization and um, their, their problems. So what's wrong with layers? Um, everybody knows this pattern. We have um, a layered, in this case, it's a web application. We have a web layer at the top, takes in requests, um, maps them into some kind of domain model, um, passes it onto the business layer. The business layer does some business processing, calls to the database layer, uh, the data layer, which talks to a database, saves data in the database, retrieves data from the database. Pretty straightforward. Um, so what's wrong with that? So um, like Michael said this morning, we are pretty good in um, slicing, in, in, in um, uh, modularizing horizontally, which is layers, basically. So we have these um, horizontal modules, but we're not so good in modularizing um, vertically, um, which means that uh, over time, a lot of horizontal dependencies creep in. 
because the only rule in the layered architecture is that um, the arrows must point down. So um, the topmost layer can have dependencies to the layers below it. So um, and that's the only rule. That means if we have a, um, two classes up in the web uh, layer, for example, they might have dependency to each other, and it's, it's valid in, in a layered architecture. Um, what also happens with layers is um, often that the um, use cases that we're implementing are hidden somewhere in, in a layer, because we often, um, over time, um, the, the business layer grows very broad. We have these services. Anybody worked on a user service at some point? Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of service that um, we see that does everything, um, probably not just for one type of user, but for all of them. Um, also, what's bugging we, me with layers is that there is a big architecture code gap. So the architecture diagram is pretty much this. this is the architect. We have three items that we can talk about. Um, but actually, there's a lot more going on in these layers. So every time we um, talk about the architecture and have to find something in the code, we have to do some mental mapping um, to find out where we have to go. Um, yeah, and in general, a layer is just doing too much. Um, our brain, my brain at least, um, can't handle that much information at the same time. So we're here. Um, we, we, we do have layers. Everybody can see them, but it's hard to work with, and um, we have to be careful not to cut ourselves on the, on the pieces that are sticking out. All right, so um, next thing that we might try is um, vertical slices. So instead of having one layer uh, or three layers, we have three layers in each vertical slice. We have these um, boundaries between, which is definitely the step in the right direction. Um, but slices by themselves, if we don't apply more rules, have similar problems. For example, um, if we are not enforcing the, the horizontal dependencies, which um, if, if we don't say, okay, there must be no dependencies between the vertical slices, um, we still might have horizontal dependencies creeping in. So one, um, this web, web slice might have um, access to this business, business layer. This is not how slices should work, but it might creep in over time. Slices that properly work would have these boundaries here. Um, and if we don't enforce that properly, we have this problem um, that, for example, if we want to move a component out um, or a slice out into another part of the code or another microservice or whatever, um, we have these dependencies pointing, um, pointing in, the, in a void, and we have to fix all of those. Um, so what, what, when I prepared this talk, when I thought about verticals, um, what I had to think of is, is a hatch. So in the beginning, we have these very clear vertical slices that don't have a dependency to each other. But over time, um, it becomes like this. In a hedge, we want this to happen. In code, we don't want this to happen. And then after a year or so, um, or more years, um, people come and people go. Um, we're here. Uh, and the new starters don't even know um, where to look. All right. So. Um, Verticals, I'm, I'm dramatizing this a bit. If you implement verticals properly with, with all the enforcement and everything, it can work. If you do the same with layers, it can also work. Um, it's just that it's easy for those dependencies to creep in. All right, I got another one, clean architecture or hexagonal architecture. Um, who, who heard about these already? Right, about half. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to introduce them in detail, but we're going to look a bit at the, at the high level. All right, clean architecture. Um, for those who don't know, that's um, 
uh, a term that was coined by uh, Robert Martin um, in his book with the same name. Uh, the book is, is, a, is a good read, but it's very abstract. And this is one of, my, um, one of the points I want to make about clean architecture. It's very abstract. So what is clean architecture? It's still layers, but layers in a circle instead of um, on top of each other. Um, so in, in the outside, in the outermost layer, for example, we could have um, UI components or, or a database. And then we, we have controllers, we have use cases that implement um, some business logic. And in the middle, we have our domain model, which, which I call entity, or domain entities, um, which implement business rules. Um, but it's still, it's still layers. And um, what, what, is, what is interesting here in the clean architecture is, and that, that is the difference from the normal um, layered architecture, is that these dependencies point inward. So where in the um, layered architecture we have the data model at the, at the bottom and the business model above that and above that the web model, um, we have our domain model in the center of the architecture and it's protected. And the dependencies may only point toward it but not outside of it. And the reason for that is that we want to protect our domain model from dependencies to the outside. Why do we want that? Because um, if our domain model had a dependency to something at the outside, if that thing on the outside changes, our domain model might have to change as well. So that's the main reason. That's a good idea um, because our domain model is probably the most important thing. It has all the business rules, um, all the important stuff um, that we don't want to change if, some, if something outside changes. All right, so that's clean architecture in a nutshell. Um, the book doesn't, the, the clean architecture book goes into a bit more detail, but it's still very abstract and it doesn't give a lot of guidance. Um, there are more um, elements here in, in, these, in these layers, but um, it's, it's very abstract and it's very hard to implement. Anyway, next, um, hexagonal architecture um, is very similar to clean architecture in that we still have layers and we still have the inward pointing dependencies. Um, so here in the outermost layer, we have what we call adapters. I call them input and output adapters. Input ad adapters could be a web adapter, for example, that takes in requests, HTTP requests from the web. Um, an output adapter could be an adapter to a database, for example. Um, and the next layer is uh, ports, input ports and output ports, I call them here, which is basically interfaces. Um, and these interfaces are implemented by the output adapters and they're called by the input adapters. And in the middle, again, we have our domain model, our entities, um, and maybe use case implementations um, that implement the business rules. So similar concept to clean architecture, inward pointing dependencies are domain model is um, protected um, from outward facing dependencies if it's properly enforced uh, the dependencies. Um, but hexagonal architecture gives a, gives a bit more structure. We have um, more, concrete more concrete concepts to talk about. We have adapters, we have ports, and that gives us some tools to work with. So in my opinion, a bit more concrete than clean architecture, easier to work with still has some flaws, which I'm going to talk about now. So clean and hexagonal architecture are great for a rich domain model. A rich domain model is like you, you applied domain-driven design. You build this um, very rich domain model um, with um, business rules and um, everything um, modeled out in your, in your domain model. Um, and it's great for that because if you have a rich domain model, you want to protect it. And this architecture does exactly that. Um, but how many of you have worked on a code base with a, with a rich domain model, what you would call rich domain model? It's about 10 hands. Um, and this is exactly why I think in many cases this architecture is, is an overkill. We, often, we just don't often have a rich domain model. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a rich domain model. 
I'm just saying that we often don't have one for whatever reasons. The reason might be that we just didn't think of it. The reason might be that we tried and failed. Um, whatever the reason, we often don't have it. The reason might be that it's not applicable to, our, uh, to the application that we're building. There are types of applications that just don't warrant a rich domain model. Um, next, everybody seems to interpret clean and hexagonal architecture differently. Especially clean architecture, like I said, is very abstract. You ask three architects and you get five opinions um, about how to implement it. Um, hexagonal architecture is a bit more structured, but even so, if you Google for hexagonal architecture, you will find um, 10 different ways of implementing it. I, am, um, I added another inter interpretation in my book, so I'm kind of part of the, part of the evil, but anyway. Um, what we need instead is um, simplicity. So I want to have a very simple code organization pattern that we can use to um, organize our code. Uh, and that is the question that I want to address with uh, the component-based architecture. All right, and um, finally, let's talk about component-based architecture. Mm. When I talk about component, um, I y you can also call it a module, or um, it's I, I don't I'm not passionate about the name. I just call it a component for this talk. When I um, say component, what I mean is um, a group of classes that do a thing together, or th that belong together, high cohesion um, classes that, that belong together. So an architecture might look like this. We have a web component at the top, which um, is pretty much the same as our web layer in the layered architecture. Um, or we have some input component, whatever that might be, wherever that the input might come from. Um, and then we might have two functional components and an integration component to the right. So each component, when, when I say component, it's, it's a set of classes, cohesive classes, that have a dedicated API. And that makes the difference to um, plain layers and plain vertical slices, this, this thing, the dedicated API. So the web component may call our functional components through this API and only through this API. And... Um, for example, the, the middle functional component here that, that does some functional thing may call the integration component on the right also through this API, and this integration component might connect to a database or a third-party system or whatever. So um, very similar to vertical slices with the addition of a dedicated API, um, and also the addition of um, nested components. So inside one of these components, it can consist of multiple other subcomponents. So in this case, for example, our functional components, our parent functional components, are made up of like a functional inner component, which implements the use cases, um, and a data component, which um, connects to a database and does the storage of the data for this um, component. Um, and that means this data component and this data component um, they don't know each other, so it's, it's different, different databases or schemas or whatever, different um, um, data storages. Um, and each of these internal components or subcomponents um, is built up the same way as the parent component with a dedicated API. And it might, in turn, be, be consisting of subcomponents again. Um, and if you look, look hard at the diagram here, you might notice that um, this is pointing upward, actually. So um, the functional components here may, access, uh, may have access to the classes in this API as well, which is um, applying the dependency inversion that hexagonal and clean architecture also do. So where the API, in this case, is the most important thing. Th there might be some domain classes in there and we want to protect that API from outward-facing dependencies, so everything is pointing into these API packages. 
So what are the rules for building components? Um, building components, uh, the, the first rule is each component has a dedicated namespace. Um, so we can identify it. Um, in Java, that is a package, for example. Um, then the second rule is each component has a dedicated API. And specific to Java, that would be a dedicated API package. So we have a package for the parent component, then a sub-package API. Third rule is every component has also an internal package, which, is, which contains internal classes that are not to be accessed from the outside. Everything in the API package may be accessed from the outside. Everything in the internal package may not be accessed from the outside. And the fourth rule is nesting, um, components all the way down. Let's look at each of these rules quickly. Um, namespace, um, pretty simple. We, we have multiple options. Um, Oli Drotbohm pretty much um, summed them up this morning already. We can um, uh, put components into the same code base. Um, they each have a separate package. Um, we can choose to put them into the same Maven or Gradle module, into the same jar file. Um, we could also choose to make each component its own, its own Maven module, its own Gradle module. Um, or we could even isolate them more and put each in their own code base. Um, and then ev even if they are each in their own code base, we could still deploy them together as a monolith. We can pull them out of their code base, uh, create the jar files, um, combine the jar files, and deploy it as a monolith. Um, or we could then, at some point, if we have this level of isolation, we could also decide to deploy them separately, so it's a bit easier. But it doesn't really matter which way you choose. Um, the, this component-based architecture works, works either way. Second and third rule, um, each component has an API package and an internal package. Um, pretty simple. Um, API package may be accessed from the outside, internal package not. That's, that's the rule. Fourth rule, nesting. Um, why, why nesting? We could decide to build just one component, one big component with a dedicated API. It might, it, it's still a component in, in my definition. Um, but wh why should we care about the internal structure of the component? Because if it's clean from the outside through the API, everything's good, right? Um, but if this is a big component, and it's all messy in the inside, but it's, it's looking nice to the outside, you still have to, if you have to change anything, you, you still have to work on that code. And um, you still, it's, it's not really maintainable. So what I propose is um, building, building your software from subcomponents. So multiple subcomponents build one bigger component, which might again build a bigger component. Um, and like, like we're, we're not the only ones, well, every, under, every other industry does it this way, right? A car is not built from three layers. That would be pretty hilarious. A car is built from components and subcomponents. Um, all right, so how does this nesting work with, with our dependencies? Um, there's an example here. We have two components, A and B. Each have their own API package um, and their own internal package. Um, and in this internal package, each component, in this case, has two subcomponents, A1 and A2, B1 and B2. Um, and now let's say component A1 needs to access component B2. What we can do is we can just call everything that is in component A2's API package. What we cannot do is uh, we cannot call components B1 and B2 from component A1 because A1 doesn't know anything about B1 and B2 because it's hidden in the internal package of the parent component B. So this is not allowed. If component A1 needs access to whatever components B1 and B2 implement, um, what we can do is we can move this functionality, we can expose it via the API of component B and this API is implemented by, for example, um, subcomponent B1 here. And then from subcomponent A1, we can call um, component B's API because now the functionality is exposed and public. 
Similarly, what we cannot do, even though um, they are in the same parent component, um, subcomponent A1 cannot call anything in the internal package of subcomponent A2. If we want to do that, we have to do the same thing. We have to expose whatever functionality we need in the API of component A2, and then we can call the API. So this gives us full control over the internals of our API. We can refactor anything within the internal packages of our components because it does not affect the API. Um, and that means we are, we are flexible to change things um, as we see fit. All right, so how does this look uh, in code? Let's look at a field, field study. Um, I'm not going to do live demos. Um, I haven't sacrificed to the demo gods lately, so I'm going to show some code on slides. Um, also, no start.spring.io here. I, I just can't do that many sp Spring apps in, in one talk. All right, so what we're going to build is a um, check engine component. I'm going to um, talk a bit about what that is. That is a component that I've recently actually built. Um, and uh, the check engine should execute some checks on HTML pages. So you give that check engine the URL to an HTML page, to, to a website, to a web page, and it checks, for example, is there, um, are the meta tags set correctly, and is the, the, is the Twitter preview um, implemented correctly, and stuff like that. Are there errors in the HTML code? So it doesn't really matter what kind of checks, uh, we just want a, an engine that implements that properly. Um, what this engine should be able to do is uh, schedule checks. So we want to tell the engine, hey, here's a web, here's a web page. Please um, run some checks on it. And these uh, checks should be scheduled, so that they should be queued. They should not be executed um, uh, synchronously, but asynchronously, because they might take a while. Um, then the second use case is obviously execute those checks, so they should be pulled from the queue and then executed. Uh, the third thing is that um, the results of these checks, was it successful or has it failed or are there any error messages, should be stored in the database. Uh, and then the fourth is um, an API where we can retrieve the results of the checks. And um, before I even started coding, um, I thought about how to implement this, and I came up with, with these components and subcomponents. So we have the check engine as the top level component, and then um, we have a queue component, um, which is responsible for scheduling the checks. Uh, then we have a check runner component, which is uh, responsible for executing the checks. So we, we give, uh, wh when, the, uh, when the checks are come from the queue, the runner takes them and, and, and runs the checks and actually calls the web page and crawl, crawls it and, and does all the checks. And then, the, um, uh, then we have a database component that stores the results and provides an API to retrieve the results. Okay, let's see how this might look in code. Mm. I use Kotlin. Um, in the, this approach doesn't really make any difference between Kotlin and Java. Um, Kotlin makes all classes public by default. Um, but in, in this, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. This doesn't hurt us, even though it would be nice to use package, package private um, or package protected um, visibility at some point. Um, but we're going to talk about that later. All right, so we uh, have uh, our first rule, the namespace. Just a package name, nothing, nothing interesting. Um, below, uh, within that package, we have our API and internal packages, also not very um, interesting. But in that API package, it becomes a bit more interesting. So in that MPA API package, we have the um, check scheduler interface, which is implementing the first use case, which is schedule a check. Uh, we also have a second interface um, that I call check queries, which is the API to retrieve um, 
query the database for the results of the checks after they have been executed. So question is, why did I put this in two interfaces and not one? I could have made one interface, which we, I could have called check engine service or check service or whatever. Um, I pulled it into two different interfaces because um, they are going to be implemented by different subcomponents. And if I had put them in one interface, um, I couldn't have split them up into different subcomponents. I'm going to see that in a minute. All right, that's the API package of our top level component. Um, what does the internal package look like? And in the internal package, we have all three subcomponents. We have our check runner, we have our database component, and we have a queue component. And here you can see I haven't been consistent with the naming. I called it SQS and not queue. SQS, for those who don't know, is uh, Amazon's um, simple queue service, so it's, it's, it leaks implementation detail. Um, I did that because uh, this um, component doesn't have an external API, so it's not quite that bad, but still I should have called it should call it Q or something to make it more generic. Um, and then what I added is, uh, and here, here Spring enters the stage, um, I added an auto configuration class um, for the whole check engine component, which is annotated with uh, Spring's configuration and component scan annotations. Um, so what this does, uh, and I learned today that in Spring 6, I believe, um, we don't even have to do that, we, we can just annotate it with auto configuration and we can skip this one because this adds the uh, adds this configuration to the Spring Factories class and this tells Spring, hey, please load this on, on startup. This we don't have to do anymore because there is going to be a new auto configuration annotation. So what this auto configuration does is when it's on the class path, um, Spring um, checks it, uh, Spring scans it, and then it loads all the because we have a component scan, loads all the spring. And uh, by the way, this component is not what I'm calling a component in this talk. So that we should probably make that clear. This is this is a, um, a component in Spring's wording is a, is a spring bean basically, um, which is part of a component in in my in my us usage of the word. Anyway, what this does is it scans all these um, packages, so this package and all the sub-packages for Spring components, the add component annotation and all the other um, stereotype annotations and adds them to the, and instantiates them and adds them to the um, Spring application context. All right, so um, next let's look um, at each of our use cases and how, how they are implemented um, in this code. First is the use case um, scheduling a check. Uh, we have the check scheduler in the top level API of our top level component. Um, and then this is implemented by a class in our queue component. Pretty simple. And um, this is why this subcomponent, the queue component, does not have an API package because the API is exposed to the outside of the parent component. Yeah, this is what I what I just said. Uh, we we could have done it. We could have created our own API package here, and then kind of build service on on the level of the top level component. Um, Taken the call to this interface, map it to the API of our subcomponent, but that that requires mapping and everything. And um, in this case. We just don't need it yet. We might do it in the future if we think we need it, but um, this kind of mapping um, is not, need not needed yet. So, and for the queue component, what I also did is I added, again, a configuration class very similar to the previous one with the um, component scan annotation that loads all the spring components in this subcomponent and its, um, and its uh, sub packages. Um, but why did I add a separate one when I already have this one? Because this one is also annotated with component scan, and that means it will also already scan all these classes in here for Spring's annotations. Um, I did this because we might want to um, instantiate this module, th this, uh, this component 
um, by itself isolated from all other components. For example, if we want to run um, integration tests within the component, we want to wire up only this, only the, the spring components, uh, only the spring beans, I should be clearer in my wording, only the spring beans in this um, Q component and then run some tests on it. So we have, th this, is uh, this is another entry point to our, um, mod to our component architecture. We can choose on which level we, we enter the, uh, we, we, we create an application context. All right, then um, the use case storing, storing the results. Um, I created this check mutations um, interface which uh, implements, well, mutations for checks, inserts stuff in the database and updates stuff in the database. Um, this is implemented by a repository in the internal package uh, of the database component. And our check runner, which we're going to look at in a minute, um, is the only client for this, which is why I did not put this API um, in the top level. Um, because from the outside of our check engine, we only want people to be able to schedule um, checks and query, query for checks, but we do not want them to um, change things in our database. So this, um, this interface, which, which changes things in the database, we don't want to expose it on the top level. Um, next, for executing checks, um, this is our check runner. API in our check runner, a check runner interface in our check runner um, uh, subcomponent. It's implemented by an internal class here, and it's being called by um, a listener class in our queue component. This listener is listening for items from the queue, and when it finds a new item, it's calling this API, and that's implemented from here. Same reason as before. Um, the check runner, we are not exposing it on the top level in the top level API. We're only um, exposing it on this. Um, um, subcomponent level API because we don't want external clients to be able to execute checks synchronously. So this interface executes the check right now um, and not, um, not asynchronously. Uh, and the last use case, um, querying for the um, results of the checks is uh, pretty straightforward. We have this um, top level API that is implemented by this repository down here of the database component. Um, um, pretty straightforward. This is, by the way, this repository is implementing both the check mutations and the check queries interfaces um, because I didn't care about separating them in this, in this component. Might, might be worth to separate them at some point. In this case, I decided it's not worth it yet. Um, but it is important to, um, to uh, split these up into two interfaces and not one, um, because as you can see, one of the interfaces, a part of, part of the functionality you want to expose on the top level, and part of the uh, interface, part of the API, we want to expose only on the subcomponent API level. So this is why the split into smaller um, granular interfaces, even though they're implemented by the same internal class. So what have we gained by this? Um, we have closed the architecture code gap a bit, uh, or a lot maybe even though, even. Um, so we have, um, this was our architecture from the start and this is our code and it's easy to map, at least if you name the, if you name the components properly, not like me, um, but naming is hard. That's my excuse. Um, and what we can do, and this is, this is probably the, the main thing that is very um, cool with this kind of code organization is that we have a very simple way of enforcing the dependencies, enforcing valid dependencies. Um, this is um, ArcUnit, uh, which is a library that allows us to check um, dependencies. Um, and this snippet here does exactly what it says. It says that no classes that reside outside of a package with the name internal should depend on classes that reside in the package, that, that reside in the same package. And this, um, if, if there is, this is our only dependency rule, right? Everything that is in an internal package may not be called from the outside. 
Um, and then with, with this one, we can put that in a unit test. And with this one unit test, we have enforced dependencies over the whole of our code base, no matter how big it is and how many components it has. The only thing that we have to take care of is that we actually have to follow this naming convention internal, or we can, we can annotate it with a certain annotation. But we need some identifier that this is an internal package, which makes this very easy to maintain, and um, unwanted dependencies don't really creep in. You, you have to think about your dependencies. And uh, when you need some functionality, some internal functionality, you need to actually think about exposing it in the top level API. Well, do you really want to do that or not? And you can make a decision. Um, but actually, it's, it's an explicit decision and not, um, not luck. And these strict boundaries make it, um, and, and the, the um, strict dependencies uh, make it um, possible to gain a lot of evolvability, which means we can move a component around, take it out of one code base and put it into another code base, for example, because we have a dedicated API to that component. And we could, for example, um, implement a layer, a mapping layer that maps um, calls to this component. Um, and then instead, instead of calling this in, in the Java in, in, as a method invocation, it does an HTTP invocation to some other services. So. And then we've um, reached this here, hopefully, which is um, an architecture where you can actually play Tetris with. You can try to mix and match the components. And if they have the same shape, you can exchange them. And um, hopefully, everything is simpler to understand. And that is what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much for your patience. The beer is waiting. Uh, 13 minutes. <laughs>